It is my great honor to be speaking with Dr. Ming Wong, uh, a quite accomplished uh, eye surgeon based in Nashville, Tennessee, but he has an amazing story of overcoming all kinds of adversity, which is hard for many of us in the United States to even imagine uh, the things that Dr. Wong has had to face, and yet he's come out, and not only is he successful, but he's been helping literally millions of people around the world uh, receive sight and improve their quality of life. So thank you, Dr. Wong, for speaking with me and with my students. Thank you, Ron. And I know you, uh, I didn't mention uh, your your autobiography from Darkness to Sight, which students might be able to see here in the foreground, uh, was made into a movie. It was released in uh, around Labor, sorry, Memorial Day of 2024. I'm not sure it's still in theaters, but students can watch it. It's a great movie on angel.com. They could, they could watch the movie. I highly recommend it as well as your autobiography. But thank you. I know you want to give us a brief summary of your life. Yes. Thank you. First of all, um, Ron, you and Maria for the wonderful invitation. And today I will give a brief uh, presentation, a purpose-driven life. You know, it's not just about those difficulties, sufferings and challenges, but also over, not just about overcoming them, but what is the purpose? You know, why we all need to overcome them? What is the higher purpose for us as human beings? So I'm going to mention about that, what I have found for me, uh, my life's purpose. And then we go into a Q&A uh, the discussion. And, uh, you know, hopefully it will be very helpful to you and your students. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the screen now. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Okay. Ron, can you see the screen? Yes, I can see the slide. Fine, Dr. Wong. Yes. Thank you. If you see any uh, mistake in the Mandarin, let me know. Yeah, my, my I don't know if all my students know, but my wife was born in China and speaks uh, five or six languages, including Mandarin. I speak, I'll just say, when I say that, <laughs> Maria thinks I'm speaking Russian, so I speak pretty much no Mandarin, but thanks for accommodating me. <laughs> uh, no problem. So, um, uh, Professor Ram mentioned about the um, movie site. Um, it's, um, it's, it was in theaters and now it's in streaming. Actually, if one visit angel.com forward slash site, S-I-G-H-T, you can actually see this film. Uh, you can even choose Mandarin subtitle and uh, voice. Uh, my little presentation right now is called A Purpose Driven Life. On the screen, uh, all of the students and participants can see my contact information. Um, I, um, I have a PhD in laser physics, and also I have an MD um, as well from Harvard MIT. And I'm the um, CEO and director of One Vision Institute, Nashville, Tennessee. My email address, website, and the WeChat address uh, are listed. And um, Ram uh, briefly mentioned early about me. Uh, I, would, uh, I would not read this. I would just highlight two things. One is um, I have the opportunity to have developed the amniotic membrane contact lens, which has now been used uh, by tens of thousands of eye doctors throughout the world in nearly every nation and uh, millions of patients have had eyesight restored. And um, I actually I donated that technology to the world. And mm -hmm. um, the film site is about that. Also, uh, Ron mentioned that um, we have a site foundation. Um, the mission is to help blind orphan children. Um, so that is also what site uh, the movie is about. I grew up in China during a period called Cultural Revolution. From 1966 to 76, the government shut down all universities and colleges of entire China and forcefully deported every single high school graduate to some of the poorest part of the country and condemned each one of us a life sentence of hard labor and poverty. Mm. Over 10 years of Cultural Revolution, by shutting down all universities and colleges of entire China, they send away to labor camp for life, mm. 20 million young people. 1974, I was 14 and I finished my ninth grade and I was a straight student. I worked really hard and I was looking forward to attending 10th grade and beyond. Uh, I really want to become a doctor. 
uh, when the deportation came down to me as well. I got kicked out of the school. I, I was never allowed to go back. And uh, I was going to be sent away to labor camp for life, just like 20 million others. In order to avoid this devastating fate of being sent away to, to labor camp, I found that if I could play a music instrument called Chinese violin, Erhu, E-R-H-U, and if I could dance, I could get into the government's song and dance troupe, therefore avoid being sent away to labor camp. Mm -hmm. But that didn't work, so I was going to be sent away. Then I got lucky. 1976, the Cultural Revolution ended. The government reopened all the colleges in China, first time in 10 years. Wow. And my, my parents came home one day and they said, you, you may be able to go back to school. I, I thought I'd never be able to hear that in my lifetime. Mm. But they want me to jump three years ahead, having never attended 10th, 11th, 12th, and went straight from 9th to 12th and, and compete against other 12th graders for that less than 1% chance of getting to college. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, why can I wait for three years? They said, no, because government could change their mind again next year and shut down universities for another 10 years. So you see, for people who don't have freedom, when freedom comes, even briefly, they do appreciate. So with my parents' help, I worked really, really hard. You saw in the film site. And I got into universities, universities of science and technology of China, the MIT of China, mm -hmm. studied chemical physics and laser physics. And then as you see in the film site, in 1982, I came to America, a poor student with only $50 with a Chinese English dictionary, knowing no one in this country could hardly speak English, even though I was nearly penniless, but I was happy. Why? I was free. Yes. Um, I studied the PhD in laser physics at the University of Maryland, finished postdoc at MIT. Then my old dream, childhood dream of wanting to become a doctor reemerged. So I wanted to apply for medical school in America, but I was racially discriminated against. Hmm. A professor said, you're Chinese, you're no good. Actually, in the film side, you see that. Fortunately, I did not give up. I work even harder. Mm -hmm. I thought I fought once at the end of Cultural Revolution, but that was for myself to have a future. Now I can fight again, but this time, not just for myself, but also for all others who have been discriminated against mm -hmm. because of the color of their skin. So I work even harder. I got in after MIT postdoc, oh. I got enrolled at Harvard and MIT joint MD program. And in 1991, I graduated um, and I invited my parents over because I'm very grateful to them. Mm. So uh, the film site is dedicated to my parents. Mm -hmm. The reason I got two doctorate degrees, one in laser physics, one in medicine, is because medicine is very technological driven. And I want to be one of a kind laser vision surgeon who not only have an MD, but also a PhD in laser physics. Mm -hmm. I'm probably one, the, one of the few, maybe the only laser vision surgeons in the world today who also holds a PhD degree in laser physics. Mm -hmm. I have performed over 55,000 laser vision correction surgeries, including uh, over 4,000 doctors. Wow. 10 years ago, I wrote the autobiography from darkness to sight, detailing the stories about these blind orphan children, their remarkable journey from darkness to sight. But also at the same time, these children, their courage has also helped me, their eye doctor, to come from my own darkness to light spiritually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a Chinese version of the autobiography. And then the movie is being made into, uh, the book is made into movie, sight. The picture the film site has won the Best Picture winner at the ICVM International Christian Film Award last year. Mm -hmm. So here we go. You can turn up your computer volume a little bit, see the two minute okay. trailer site. And the movie, by the way, can be watched online now at ngu.com forward slash site. So here's the trailer. 
wanted to help you see again. You said it was impossible. Ah, there he is, the good doctor. You're gonna be on the cover of the Tennessee Herald tomorrow morning. You may get a date out of this. Oh, uh, no, that picture. Very funny. Our pro bono office got a call from India. A little girl, six years old. Apparently, street beggars make more money if they're legitimately blind. So the stepmother poured sulfuric acid in each of her eyes. I'm glad to help you see again. Good job. Is it true that multiple doctors declared your patient irreversibly blind? Yes. I developed this new breakthrough technology. Here we go. Do you see the light? No. I can't see anything. I had this patient from India. She reminds me of some things in the past that I can't get over. The present is made possible by the past. A long time ago, back in China, there was an uprising in my hometown. Yeah, no, no. Many bad things happened. No, no. So we came to America. Yes. It's hard getting into medical school. Are you coming from China? Don't waste your time. You cannot change the past, Ming. I feel like I'm stuck. Hello, doctor. This is Maria. We want to give her a chance to see you again. I don't even know if I can perform surgery anymore. I left it. you Stop in the room. need to just let go. I just don't want Maria to end up like a job. We can only do our best. I'm with you, Ming. We can do this. I refuse to believe there is no purpose. I will be praying for you. The job is teaching me that there's more to life than what you see. We have to keep going. I thought you said it was impossible. Can you see yourself, Maria? I'm so pretty. <laughs> After the movie was made, uh, we spent 10 years in making this film sight. The film was universally rejected hmm. by every single major Hollywood distributors, five, all 10, five of them uh, online, like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, Disney Plus, half of them um, theatrical in the theaters, like um, Sony and um, Universal and others on the grounds that, number one, they are not that crazy about Christian film. And number two, as Asian American films, they say without Kung Fu, an ancient dynasty, hmm. without Kung Fu, American, Americans will not watch it. And I decided to do something unprecedented in US history. Mm -hmm. I took the film around the United States, free of charge, over 365 days, brought a film to 40 major states in America, wow. conducted 500 free shows mm. to an audience of 50,000, all free. Every week, I work Monday through Thursday, and Friday morning, I leave and go to a state and put up five rallies, five shows. Wow. Each of them number from 100 to 2,100 per show. Mm -hmm. A friend said, you are conducting a presidential campaign. Yeah. <laughs> said, I'm conducting a campaign, all right, but not for president, but for two purposes. One is to tell our stories as Asian Americans. Stand up, tell our stories. Mm -hmm. Tell America how much contribution that immigrants minority has made to this country. But also tell Jesus stories because the message of the film site is that science and faith do work together. Mm. So then Angel Studio came forward in February as the number 11 distribution company decided to distribute the film. So it's answered to our prayer. And mm -hmm. uh, now after theatrical theater run, the film site is on um, online now by typing angel.com as you see on the bottom uh, screen forward slash site S-I-T-H-T. And if you select the basic rate like $12, you can see sight as many times you want, even with Mandarin subtitles and voice. But also, you can also 
um, to uh, see Sound of Freedom, The Chosen, The Bible Story, all of NG Studio Christian films, all for $12. Mm -hmm. The movie was made for our children to motivate them to appreciate what they have in America today and work harder. This is in Mandarin. It simply means that um, it has Mandarin uh, subtitle and voice, and you can type in ngo.com forward slash site. See this film site and also all the other NG Studio platform Christian films. Mm -hmm. And for those who want help, uh, we even have uh, a volunteer team site and um, uh, they can take care of the cost as well, the $12. Just let us know and we can set it up for you to watch the film at home free. Wow. So you can email me or WeChat me. Uh, as you see on the screen. You can take a picture of the screen. Again, site is in streaming right now, ngo.com forward slash site. What's the purpose of my life? I've been thinking about it ever since I came to America as a poor immigrant and also have become a believer. As you may have seen in the film, God's Not Dead, the Chinese student who went from being atheist to a believer in the film, God's not dead. That. that was me. Okay. So I have realized that there are five purposes specifically for me that God has uh, wanted me to live by. One is to share. As a Christians, we need to share what we have. As two examples of sharing, as I mentioned that I'm one of the few laser vision surgeons who also have a PhD degree in laser physics. And most of the doctors only have um, MD, strong medicine, but weak in technology, but medicine so technological driven. So I decided to share. I published 10 textbooks in ophthalmic wow. surgical techniques and uh, to help surgeons from around the world to improve their weak area, which is technology. And seven of the 10 textbooks have been translated in Mandarin Chinese. Mm -hmm. Second example sharing is that, as I mentioned, I invented the amniotic membrane contact lens, um, got a patent. I decided to share. That's what Jesus wants us to do. So I put a patent online, donated my patent to the world, and traveled around the world over a 20-year period, about 50-some countries, and taught, free of charge, over 10,000 eye doctors how to use it. Wow. The film site depicting this technology. Today, amniotic membrane contact lens uh, it has been used by uh, eye doctors from nearly every nation, and millions of patients have had eyesight restored. Even though in the whole, pro uh, it's actually is a five billion dollar industry now worldwide. Mm. Even though in the process, I did not make any money, but I fulfill one of the purposes I feel God wanted me to live by. That is to share. Thank you. Second, thank you is to remember. As an immigrant, we all have uh, Asian roots, but how can we also embrace the West? As an example of remembering my roots, remember I mentioned during Cultural Revolution, I had to play the Chinese violin to escape labor camp. Now I use the instrument to share my cultural heritage with America. Mm -hmm. The third purpose is to progress, to progress human knowledge and improve the quality of our lives. That's another purpose that God want me to live by. This is a photo of Kajol, a blind, five-year-old blind orphan child depicted in a film site. She was intentionally blinded by her own mm. stepmother who pours sulfuric acid into her eyes, trying to make Kajol a blind child orphan who then sing on the streets who will get more money from tourists. Mm. This is Kajol's eye when we brought her to America. And I start doing research, trying to figure out how can I reduce scar to re restore her eyesight. And, and I realized the only person who does not scar is the unborn child. But how can we do research on unborn child, the fetus, so that we can restore eyesight in our patients, but at the same time, without hurting a fetus? They say there's no common ground between faith and science. Is it really true? So that leads up to the number four purpose that I found in life for me as a Christian and as a scientist is to find, to find common ground based on shared humanity. You see, Christ wants us to um, overcome our polarization and find the common ground, whether it's East and West, 
whether it's black and white, whether it's Democrat or Republican, and whether it's faith and science. Mm -hmm. I pub, uh, established a common ground network to study the methodology, how to find common ground. And with uh, e even uh, with my pastor study how Christ find common ground, we established common ground seeking steps, S-T-E-P-S. S, see the common ground. You got to see, otherwise you will never find it. T, trade places. I learned that as an eye doctor, I have to, if Ron, if I had to fix your eyes, I have to look uh, at the world from your perspective because you're the only person who is seeing through that pair of eyes of yours. So speak in the language of listener. Empathy, uh, when we meet someone who is different, ideas, as Americans today, we tend to yell and shouting and demonizing the other side. But instead of doing that, how about taking out the SALT principle, S-A-L-T. S, start a conversation. A, ask a question. L, listen, and then and only then, talk. P, persevere, pay the price. And finally, S is put into action. Actually doing it, seek the common ground. You know who inspired us to formulate this common ground seeking steps, S-T-E-P-S, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Mm. You see, he saw the common ground with us as human beings. He traded places with us by becoming one of us. He demonstrated the empathy towards the people, even in the lowest one of society, like women by the well in the Bible. Nobody wants to talk to her, but Christ did. He paid the ultimate price by dying for our sin at the cross. And finally, he sought the common ground as human being. He actually put it into action. I even, with my pastor, published a common ground Bible study. Shows two things. One is, is Christ calling in an unprecedented, polarized, and divided world today? Is Christ calling to all of us as Christians to be a, a, a unifier, to overcome the polarization, to find the common ground? What a historical opportunity for Christians to act differently to be the best common ground seeker, modeling after Christ. So that's the common ground uh, Bible study, but also this book summarized from scriptures, how to find those common ground. Mm -hmm. So coming back to the question about the fetal healing, I realized maybe we can use, uh, I started praying and with other scientists, I asked God, is there a common ground between science and faith? How can I do research on fetal tissue without hurting a baby? And um, in one of the prayers, I felt that God was giving me a uh, re realization that I can use the placenta, maybe the amniotic membrane, the mm -hmm. membrane that surround every one of us before birth is what's giving us the ability to heal without scar before birth. And after birth, we lose the membrane protection. That is why we start scarring after birth. I went to hospital, get many placentas donated to me. My mother's after giving birth to children, the placenta is discarded anyway, so it does not hurt the baby. And I start doing research on the placenta amniotic membrane, eventually mm -hmm. develop the amniotic membrane contact lens. Wow. When we put this amniotic membrane contact lens, the fetal contact lens onto injured eyes, indeed, we find the eyes start behaving, healing as if it were not born yet. And much was much less scar and side wow. issues. And um, I, uh, as I said, I um, uh, uh, got patents. Uh, and then I asked myself, did I really uh, develop the technology? I concluded no, because I did not invent the placenta, nor did I invent, uh, nor did I invent the amniotic membrane. Got it. As a scientist, I was just fortunate to have the opportunity to be given by God, the opportunity, the rare opportunity to catch a little glimpse of part of his original creation. Mm -hmm. So I decided to donate my patent to the world. I put it online, the patent, and it went around the world over 20 year period and taught over 10,000 eye doctors um, in 50 some countries how to use the technology. Today, mm -hmm. as the film site depicts this, and your membrane contact lens is, uh, is now, has now been used by uh, eye doctors from nearly every nation and millions of patients have the eyesight restored. Incredible. And it's a $5 billion industry. Um, and even though I did not make any money, but I felt I have done the right thing because God wants us to share. Mm. Uh, uh, 
dry eyes is one of the leading causes of sight loss in patients get, who uh, are getting older. Aging, eye damaging, um, big factor is the dry eyes. This patient in her 70s suffering severe dry eyes. We put the amniotic membrane contact lens on. Now she's very happy. Wow. So amniotic membrane contact and show that science and faith can indeed work together. And that is the faith message of the film side. That's why Sight is about telling our stories as Asian Americans, immigrants, minorities, but also it's about telling Jesus stories because it says science and faith, God want them to work together. Finally, I want to tell you I live in Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, this is our uh, eye center. We have some of the best technologies in the world because of my dual training in MD and also a PhD in laser physics. I published a paper in the world-renowned journal Nature as the first author. And also I used to serve at USFDA ophthalmic device panel as the first Chinese Americans to do so. We have international training center. And this is a, um, a list of all the latest top four technologies that humankind has to offer in year 2024. And the students, you can take a picture, you can contact me if you have any questions. On the right upper corner is our weekly Zoom. Every Tuesday, <clears throat> we give an educational Zoom, talk about this technology. And also lower left corner is my email address. We now have conquered all five human eye prescription conditions, nearsightedness, mm -hmm. farsightedness, astigmatism, presbyopia, and the cataracts. Mm -hmm. Using these top four technologies on the screen. The left upper corner is smile. LASIK eye surgery is going out of date. LASIK eye surgery is going out of date. It's not being replaced by even better technology called small incision LASIK or SMILE. Lower left corner is implantable contact lens. If you wear contact lenses and you don't want to have to remove it at bedtime every night, I've got a technology that put contact lens inside your eyes. So mm. you never need to remove it. Implantable contact lens. In the middle for you and I, Ron, over age 45, we got technology to fix the reading now. In fact, this technology for every young lens in the middle can, in one surgery, fix all five human eye conditions, nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, presbyopia, and the cataracts. Mm -hmm. On the right is cataract surgery. It now can be performed by laser. But despite the fact that uh, these five, four technologies are the best now humankind has to offer, but even in a country like the United States, very advanced in technology, only 5%, only 5% surgeons are using it. 95% surgeons are still using old blade. Why? Because most of the doctors are trained in medicine, MD, but they are still learning and tra being trained in technology. Mm. But in contrast to the United States, which are using these top four technologies only 5% of the time, in our center, One Vision Institute, we use it one 100% of the time. We're leading the nation, uh, number one in the United States, in the percentage of high-tech application in laser vision correction surgeries. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, I published this textbook to educate the surgeons to improve their weak area, which is technology. And these are translated translate Mandarin Chinese. Living in Nashville, Tennessee, I have my share of star patients like Dolly Parton, Nicole Kidman, Ashley Judd, et cetera. Mm. I had never forgot I came from China. China has given me the character and grit, and America has given me the opportunity. So I've been going back to China every year, teaching free of charge Chinese ophthalmologists how to, um, ophthalmologists to improve their um, technology eye care. I performed the first all laser LASIK in China. Wow. Our patients at One Vision Institute now in Nashville, Tennessee, have had patients come from over 40 states in America and 55 countries. Mm. USA News Report and also Forbes Magazine Report. So number last purpose is to help. I think Christ wants all of us to help those who need the most help. That's why I have built a foundation to help blind orphan children from around the world. You see in the film site, the stories of two such blind orphan children. And remember, I mentioned the cultural revolution, I have to learn dance, how to escape labor camp. Now I use it to uh, as a tool to raise money to help the medical charity organization foundation, even though these surgeries are free, 
but we raise money to help these kids travel and their education and room and lodging. And uh, so I invent the concept called the eyeball, using ballroom dancing, the beauty of dancing to remind people how precious our sight is as human beings and how much we need to help those who have lost sight. Mm. Our foundation has patient, helped patients from uh, around the world, not only children, but also adults. And finally, as the Chinese Americans, I need I recognize I need to stand up for our rights and we need to step into American mainstream circle to help America. I established the Tennessee Immigrant and Minority Chamber of Commerce to help each other in business, but also help America. As a Christian, my favorite Sunday presentation at churches is to talk about God wants science and faith to work together. I've delivered that Sunday presentation at over 250 churches from around the world in the past 20 years. And um, Chinese Americans minorities stand up for our rights. Oh, this is the Nashville of the year, a rare honor. The first time this award uh, was given to a, a Chinese in Nashville history, mm -hmm. one person a year. Um, I, I've been teaching at the Christian University, the Trevecca University about science and faith, I work together, receive honorary doctor degrees. So a purpose-driven life is what I've been focused on today. I've realized that science is necessary, but science is just a tool. It's necessary, but not sufficient for a purpose-driven life. The sufficient condition to have a uplifting purpose-driven life is a belief in Christ. So science give me the tools, faith give me the purpose, what I'm gonna use my tools for. Um, in my case, God want me to use my two doctorate degrees that I've obtained in 31 years of schooling to help those who need the most help, the blind orphan children. So you may be an engineer, you may, may be an accountant, you may be a um, civil engineer, architect, but God will have his specific purpose for you. Your knowledge of your profession uh, is the tool, but God will give you a Christ-centric purpose also beyond what you normally do. And, and the, so if anyone's interested in my book, you can visit winefoundation.com, click the donate button, uh, sending $25, and we will send your book uh, signed by me. All proceeds goes to the foundation to help more blind orphan children. So winefoundation.com. So in summary, I have to talk about five purposes as a Christian I've come to realize. One is to share our knowledge with others. Number two is to remember our roots and embrace the present. Number three is to progress our knowledge to improve the quality of our lives. Number four is to find the common ground in a polarized world based on sheer humanity. Mm -hmm. And last, number five is to help those who need the most help. So if uh, students, if you say, what is Dr. Wang one singular vision, inspiration that driving you to formulate these five different purposes? There's really only one purpose underlying these five. That is, as a Christian, I realized that God wants us to utilize this opportunity being on this planet a few decades to do one thing, that is, to do what each of us we can to make the world a little better place to live. Thank you, Wang. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Um, as I mentioned, this is one of the most remarkable life stories I've ever heard. And it's almost like a dream that I'm actually talking to you. I guess I'll turn my uh, video on, but I don't know that it's important for people to see my face. Um, my wife, as you know, Dr. Wang, was born in China. And when we heard your story, and li we listened to the audiobook actually last year, um, she said, well, we'll have to meet him. I said, we have no chance of meeting this man. He's the most famous eye surgeon in the world. And now he's got the book and the movie. And not only are you this accomplished surgeon, uh, you are a very gracious man to speak to me uh, with no, no real incentive other than to want to share your information and help other people. So we're, we're really... Uh, very thankful to you, Dr. Wong, for doing that. Uh, thank you. Yes, I may be, I told my wife, I may be a famous eye doctor, but I'm famous in my house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everybody knows me in my house. <laughs> so you've covered so much that's relevant to entrepreneurship, but in the time that we, we can allow, I, I just have a couple of questions uh, that maybe would help our students. Uh, first is 
overcoming adversity. And we see it again and again. Successful entrepreneurs always have setbacks, always have failures. And really the defining pattern we see is they learn from those setbacks and failures. They're, they're not defined by those. They're actually kind of refined or they're, they're made better through them. I don't think I've ever spoken with someone who I knew had as many setbacks as you did. I mean, you were about condemned to a life of slavery. It looked like you're going to basically be a hard laborer for the rest of your life. You were deprived the ability to go to high school, even though you were a brilliant student. You were not going to be allowed to even go past the eighth grade. Um, you come to the United States almost miraculously, and then you face racism where uh, an administrator at a medical school says, don't even bother because you're Chinese, even though you're you're brilliant, obviously, and you've done very well in laser physics. Don't even bother. We don't want, basically, we don't want Chinese here. A lot of people would be devastated by that. And just so many setbacks. I don't want to give away the movie, but the movie, you have a, a deep, you know, a heartbreaking setback with one of your patients. Um, you almost want to give up medicine, but you don't. And then you go on and develop the MEI contact lens, and then you save it with the world. So, so much, Dr. Wong. But is, is there any any advice you want to give to students as to how to deal with, with these setbacks, with these failures, and how, how to actually turn those into learning experiences? Great question. Uh, great question, Ron. That, um, Ryan Holiday has a book, <clears throat> Obstacle is the Way. Uh, New York Times bestseller. And uh, my what I've learned in life is very much along that line. That is, we tend to think setbacks is a negative. It's in the way that we have to go around. What I've learned that setback is not in the way that we have to go around, is the way we have to go through. Mm -hmm. Only by going through setbacks and failures can we grow in our character. So uh, once I come to realize that I actually, when I meet a challenge, a difficulty, a setback, I realize that it is necessary. I need to have that. If I don't encounter the setbacks, I would not grow. So this viewpoint turning a setback from a, a negative thing into a positive thing, it into a necessary thing, it into a mm, must, uh, a, a, a go through step into mm -hmm. a way, a, a pathway, only through which that can lead to growth. Um, that is a fundamental change in my uh, outlook and my mm -hmm. viewpoint towards setbacks. So I still encounter setbacks all the time, Ron, um, today. But every time I meet a difficulty, I realize, I said to myself, you know, this is necessary. If I can go through it, it's going. It's only through go through in this can I get to what I want to go. Mm -hmm. So I will encourage all students next time you encounter difficulty and setbacks, recognizing that. Thank you. It is actually good to have that opportunity to build up your character to overcome the obstacle. So obstacle is not in the way that you have to go go around. Mm -hmm. Obstacle is the way only through going through obstacle itself can we um, accomplish anything in life. Thank you. Wonderful. If I may, an another question that's related. Um, a lot of people are surprised to find that one of the reasons that small businesses fail is um, is the success and, and they often grow too fast. And, and really the root of it, Dr. Wang, is that uh, the entrepreneur starts getting a big head. They get they get an ego and they 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 realize success and they start thinking, well, it's all about me because I'm so smart. And then once they develop that attitude, people around them start to sense that, that they, you know, they think they're smarter than everybody else. And if there's any human being I've ever met, <laughs> Dr. Wong, who could say, well, I am smarter than everybody else. I think you scored higher than anyone ever has on the medical exam, entrance exam, the MCAT. So you could have that attitude. But you don't. You have that humility and a lot of literature on this, particularly Jim Collins, who wrote a book, How the Mighty Fall. He also wrote Good to Great. They're kind of yes. complementary books. One is why are successful leaders successful? And it's basically their humility. Why do successful people fail? It's basically they lose their humility and he gets what they get what he calls hubris or extreme arrogance. Of anybody I've met, Dr. Wong, you have every right to be extremely arrogant with all of the things that you've done. Um, how do you put it in perspective? So you overcome the failures, but then you find this incredible success. 
you know, going to Harvard Medical School, this great invention that's, that's that restores sight to thousands of people. How do you keep yourself humble and still learning and growing uh, past, you know, where everyone's just giving you accolades? Great question. Great question. As you mentioned that um, some entrepreneur, um, if they achieve success early, their heads become too big mm -hmm. out of proportion of what they have done. Um, and I totally agree. And not only that, I would add, when their heads get too big, not only um, they, um, they lose their humility, um, but also they lose an opportunity to continue growth. So, you know, early success will give the wrong impression to a person that, yes, you have success, which is true objectively, but the second notion, you also have built a character. No, not, not necessarily that's the case. Early success often is occurring in an individual who has not yet to go through challenges in life, have not yet, have not yet built a character yet. Mm -hmm. So I think the two downsides to have a big head early on, one is lose their humility, the, 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 the head out of proportion to what one has done, but also lose a valuable opportunity to continue build the inner character. Um, and and the, it's the inner character at the end that really matters, I think, for a human being. For me, how do I maintain uh, the humility? Um, I look at what I've done in life not what uh, the, the actual things I've done. I look at it as, have I uh, done my best? Mm -hmm. So in other words, I, shift, I shifted the focus on objective outcome to subjective effort. Mm. So what that means is that if I accomplish something, either amnion membrane contact lens, it's wonderful objective, but I don't focus on that. I ask myself, have I done my best mm -hmm. in this process? I sometimes will identify things that I could have done better in that developmental process for the invention. Mm -hmm. And I say, ooh, there's something I could have done my be uh, done better. The next time I would do better on this. Mm -hmm. So by shifting my focus from objective accomplishment to subjective inner character growth. Mm. Uh, that's my answer to your question. Uh, how can I continue to maintain my humility? Because every time I re-examine myself, guess what? I always discover there are a few things that I could have done better. Yeah. And then Terrific. I focus on that. And next time I utilize a better uh, methodology, better way of approaching. So not focusing on the things we do, but focus on how we do it is the answer. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, another question, if I may, was somewhat related um, and very relevant for those of us who are you know, wanting to be entrepreneurs or are entrepreneurs. Um, I've actually borrowed one of your phrases, uh, Dr. Wang, that you mentioned and is in one of your books, speak in the language of the learner. And part of that is we need passion to be successful entrepreneurs. And we certainly see it in you. You're very passionate about helping people restore their eyesight. You've done it. Um, but the flip side of that is sometimes if you have too much passion, then, then you can lose sight of the, the recipient, in our case, often the customer, or in your case, the patient, and seeing it from their, their viewpoint. And I think this is really particularly relevant for you, because if you were to speak to me as an ophthalmologist, it would be a foreign language. If you were to explain, say, for one of your patients, say, Kajalamu, what was the issues, it would be a completely foreign language and I would have no idea. So you wouldn't speak to your, your patient probably with all that technical language, they'd be confused. However, as an entrepreneur, sometimes you get good at what you do, or at least you're very passionate. And then you are gonna deliver what we call an elevator pitch. And we practice that in our intro course, You know, a one minute pitch of explaining to a prospective customer that you understand their problem and how your product or service can actually improve their life. But so often people take their passion and they start saying, hey, here's who I am, here's what I have, and this is why it's so wonderful. And it's really all about them. It's all about the entrepreneur. And they're not speaking in the language of the listener. They're not connecting 
with the, they don't have the empathy. You mentioned empathy as well, but I like the way you put it again, speaking the language of the listener. You, you might have the empathy, but your passion makes makes you kind of assume, well, of course they can see it the way I can see it. And no, they can't see it the way you can see it. They're not you. So Dr. Wang, how do you how do you develop that empathy? How do you develop that ability to not only just see from the, the customers or the, or the patient's perspective, but actually put it into terms that they can understand? Um, and again, in your discipline, it must be very difficult because what you're describing is something very complicated technically. And my guess is almost all of your patients have no background in terms of the, the anatomy of the eye or the types of procedures you, you need to do? Great question. How do I develop um, this um, desire to speak the language of the listener? Um, I actually, I developed that through failure, mm. um, through a hard lesson. Uh, I studied very hard. As I mentioned, I got two doctorate degrees, a PhD in physics and MD. Then I thought, ooh, I'm it. I got all the skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, my patient would be very happy. I'm passionate about my profession, 31 years of schooling, of schooling mm -hmm. and learning. And then I realized that as a young uh, doctor then, ophthalmologist starting out, even though I have all the technologies and skill, some of my patients are not happy. Mm. So then I pondered. I asked myself, why? And I realized something very interesting. That, Ron, if I want to help your eyes to help you see better. I have to listen to you. Um, because in this wide, well, big planet, 8 billion people, you are number one authority in describing what you're seeing, what you're not seeing. Because right. you're the only one who's seeing through their pair of eyes of yours. So if I want to help your eyes, I have to try to find a way to see the world from your perspective, meaning mm -hmm. tell me that one I can see this, but that I cannot see, or this looks wavy, or this looks blurry. I have to listen. Sometimes as a young doctor with the technology, uh, you know, uh, the learned technology and skill, I fail to listen. I would just mm -hmm. come in and, throw, you know, some doctors still do that, throw down medical jargons and quickly just left. Hey, nurse, follow up. And then as a patient, you say, doc, do you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I learned that that yes, I'm passionate, but I'm passionate, not what I think is most important, is important. I'm passionate about something that is most important to my patient right. and that is important. Yes. So I intention, so I learned that lesson. So I intentionally developed another dimension in my medical practice, which is try to speak language listener. I listen to my patients. I devise technologies trying to simulate what they are seeing. And so I would say as an entrepreneur, do we need to be passionate? Absolutely. Because, you know, very often we focus on things, what to do, how to do this business, but more important than what and how is why. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? So yes. why is that passion? There's no question, but I've learned the most important about the passion is not what I think is most important, is important, is what the folks that I'm trying to help thinks most important mm -hmm. is most important. Mm -hmm. And I was passionate about what is important to my listener. Mm -hmm. Not what I want to say is what he or she needs help with. Mm -hmm. So give an example, elevator uh, pitch you talk about. Entrepreneur, when we get to a networking event, our natural instinct is keep on talking about ourselves. Yep. And you know, we all have the experience when we go to a social networking event, you meet a stranger, hey Ronnie, oh, Ronnie, how are you? And Ronnie start talking, start talking, talking about his uncle, his brother, his sister, his family. Then I sit there, look at Ronnie and say, Ronnie, do I know them? <laughs> Are you talking for the sake of talking? Mm -hmm. Are you talking for the sake of wanting to say things? Or are you talking or hearing yourself talk? Mm -hmm. Or do you really want to communicate with me and talk about things that I want to hear? Yes. So my suggestion to all entrepreneurs is two things. One, be passionate. Yes, 
absolute, that's the why we do things. More important what to do and how to do it. Mm-hmm. But be passionate about things that people you're trying to help is passionate about. Mm-hmm. Second, the way to find out what those people you're trying to help, what they're passionate about, is the SALT principle, S-A-L-T. Mm-hmm. Start a conversation, ask a question, listen, and then and only then talk. Great. Great. Well, thank you. I mean, there's so much research to support that among the, the most successful entrepreneurs and business leaders that their passion is for something bigger than themselves. And they, they truly they want to succeed as you do. You're extremely successful, but they want to succeed for something bigger than themselves. And in your case, really helping people in, in, in a monumental way of going from literally blindness to sight or impaired vision to sight. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Wong, for that. Um, if I can ask one more question, I know sure. uh, we've gone a little longer sure. than I anticipated. Maybe one more question. No problem. All right. So we know entrepreneurs often they want to be innovative. And uh, one of your great breakthrough technologies was the amniotic uh, membrane contact lens. And you you did a great job, of course, in describing that. Uh, it's brilliant. Um, it's beautiful how it promotes healing. But I remember in your book, which I have here and I didn't have in the background there, uh, I'm, t- I'm speaking about the book, actually, From Darkness to Sight, which I also have. My students can see it. You probably can't see it. In any case, you talk about you were helping your brother who also had moved to the United States at that point. And you're a doctor and you're struggling with this healing of the eye, right? And then and then you're you're like in this U-Haul truck or something and your brother pu- uh, pulls over to put a contact lens in his eye. And then yes. it's just something in your mind connects and you go, of course, we could put something like a contact lens over to promote healing. And you got that, that idea of, well, the placenta has healing properties with the amniotic membrane. But what we found is often these kinds of uh, breakthrough ideas or innovations, they come after you've kind of been struggling for a while. And then you take, whether it's a day break or a week, or you're doing something else, maybe just because you have to, or maybe you're on vacation, or in your case, you're helping your brother, and then it comes together. So there's something often about the, the brain. Yes, think about the problems and you'll you'll be struggling and, and you won't maybe be able to figure it out. But then sometimes you start thinking about something else and, and your brain makes a connection. I know that's a very difficult question, uh, but any thoughts on innovation, on how coming up with innovation, um, what kind of process might help students become more innovative? Mm. It's a very important question. That is, where do our inspiration come from? Um, what I found in my life is that we exist in two logical world, uh, two two kinds of worlds. Mm-hmm. One is logical, one is emotional and intuitive. And every human being is like that. And Jonathan Haidt, in his bestseller book, uh, the the Righteous Mind. Mm. Uh, New York Times bestseller that I'll talk about that. Every one of us is 90% emotional, 10% logical. Mm. 90% is a big emotional elephant and 10% is the little um, uh, elephant rider sits on top of the elephant. Mm. We may think we are logically control well our behaviors. No, we're largely emotional animal. So the little elephant rider on top of elephant is the White House press secretary. (laughs) <laughs> who will get on stage and White House press uh, meeting to explain away what president has just irrationally done. Oh, <laughs> Trying to uh, put some reason to it. You mm-hmm. know, and that's what this little, pre- uh, you know, so our logical mind is busy in trying to justify what we have emotionally, intuitively have done. We often mm. hear the expression, yeah, I've done something. I don't know why I did it wrong. Well, I did do that. It just... I did it not under control of my logical self, which is only 10%. In fact, mm. um, uh, Ray uh, Dalio, in his book, a uh, seminal book, another New York Times bestseller, The Principle, talk about that we may think as human beings, we fight uh, us against the world. No, as you, every human being, we live through life really is a struggle, a f- process fighting among within ourselves. Mm-hmm. Between what? Between upper brain and lower brain. The mm. lower brain, the midbrain, the intuitive, emotional, the rhythm, the primitive instinct, which is formed a long time ago. The upper brain, the cerebral cortex, the logical, only formed in the more recent, um, you know, uh, tens of thousands of years. So the, 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 the logical behavior human being is 
come much later and control much smaller dimension of our lives. And Thomas Jefferson in one of his books mentioned that as well. So 90% is the deep inner brain. So we go through life is fighting between our upper brain and uh, uh, so the, the midbrain. And the upper brain tell us what we should do and the midbrain tell us what we feel like doing. Mm. Now, as an entrepreneur, we often make the mistake that thinking our invention, our thinking, our inspiration come from only logical analysis. No, because 90% of us is emotional self, the big mm -hmm. elephant. That's intuitive, that's illogical, that's irrational. In fact, there's another book uh, called Predictably Irrational. Mm -hmm. As a human being, it's irrational, but it's predictable, it's interesting. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is that that predictability of irrationality, we may think irrationality, so what? I have no control, so why do I need to depend on that? Business inspirations, aha moment, often come from the intuitive irrational aspect, but it's mm. predictable irrational. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm. So in other words, there's a way to uh, maximize the intuition, the way to clean up the clutter in your mind, let your intuition, let your instinct come into play. So in business, the applicability is recognizing that we operate most of the time in the logical space, 10%, but sometimes we have to be intentional. Let ourselves put down all the 10% logical mess. It seems there's no way out in a business uh, dilemma and enter intentionally into the illogical world, the mm -hmm. emotional, the intuitive world, the instinctive mm -hmm. world, which is 90% of us mm -hmm. by uh, doing something like my inspiration often come in a shower, for example, really? that I'm going in the shower and I'm not thinking and then some idea comes. So it's not a um, uh, accident. The, the, the fact that we sometimes come up with inspiration and problem solving aha moment when we're doing something else. It is actually a scientific base. That is an intentional effort to leave the messy, logical dilemma um, plaguing world, but only 10% of us anyway, intentionally remove the clutter in your mind, enter into a fresh, new, and much larger intuitive inner uh, emotional world, that 90% elephant. I see. That's where we can find lots of aha moments. I've never heard that, Dr. Wong, uh, that 90% versus 10%. Um, it's surprising to me, but you, you certainly have the credibility as you know an eye surgeon and working with the brain and, and all of all of the uh, the physics as well as the uh, the neurological processes. So thank you for that insight. Uh, we are just a few minutes under an hour, and I want to respect your time. But I'll just ask Dr. Wong: Is there anything else that you want to share with my college students who are either entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs? And any other uh, advice that you'd want to share with them? I have one. Thank you, Ron. In the film, The Graduate, mm -hmm. uh, the character Ben, played by Dustin Hoffman, uh -huh. high school graduate star, he came home, his parents put a big party for him, and uh, actually he trying to escape all the attention of these elderly people, mm -hmm. and he kept down from the stairs, and he said, hey, Ben, what are you going to do now? And he, he, he wanted to escape. He turned around, he said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bathroom. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> so he went, went, went upstairs. Next time he came down, he was again surrounded by uh, these uh, parents, friends. But one uh, uncle came over. He said, Ben, come over here. Yes, yes. M you know, Mr. Smith. Yes, come over here. Ben, I have one word for it. Yes, uncle. Finally, Ben came in. The old person told Dustin Hoffman's character, Ben, said, I just have one word. Oh, yes, yes, one word. What's that? Plastics. Yeah. <laughs> so I, for all your students, I said, come over here. Come over here. Uncle Ming has a little one word for you. <laughs> okay. Yes. What's the, what's one word, Uncle Ming? AI. I'm glad it's not plastics, but AI. Yeah. Okay. AI. AI is transforming the world. Mm. AI will eliminate 99% of human jobs. Oh my. 99%. AI will cause uh, a changing world on the plus aspect could give unleashed creativity and capability and the minus side would be more destructive than even mm -hmm. atomic bomb. Wow. 
at this time, as a student in colleges, you recognize that there's a way to not only survive, so you still have a job five years, 10 years from now with uh, all the jobs are replaced by AI, but also master it. Okay, riding that big elephant. Mm -hmm. Okay, be a masterful elephant rider. So students always ask me a question, how can I uh, learn so that my job will not be replaced eventually by AI? And this is what I learned. Uh, it's a Carl uh, Newport has another book, New York Times bestseller called The Deep Work. That is, be that one percent. Be that one percent, because if human being has ten level existence, the lowest three level already being replaced by AI, and mm -hmm. AI is approaching the number four level. Eventually, come all the way to number nine level. You know what's in the top ten, a uh, top ten percent, the top level that is unlikely to be replaced by AI ever. That is the intuition. Intuition. The, the instinct. Mm -hmm. So be that one percent. Learn about life itself. Build that character, the instinct, the work ethics. One percent, what I mean is not in achievement. One percent is what I meant when I talked early about effort. Be that one percent in effort. The deep work of Carl Newport, then you will not only survive in the AI world coming up now, but also succeeding. Fantastic. I've never had advice quite like that, Dr. Wong, and it's so relevant. So where I, you know, Jackson College, it's a hot topic AI. I go to faculty meetings. I went to a seminar earlier this summer and everyone's talking about AI, but I've really not encountered anyone that has any really good advice regarding it, other than we don't know where it's going to go, but I really appreciate your insights there. Thank you so much for that. Thank it's you. Been thank wonderful. you. We're just about in an hour. So thank you again, Dr. Wong. I know you have an extremely busy schedule. You've carved an hour out of your life. Um, thank you. And I know we'll, we'll be doing some other things along with uh, my wife has some things that you're helping with, and we thank you for that. But uh, we really appreciate uh, all that you've done for the world and certainly for my students here at Jackson College. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And thank you, Maria. Um, Maria's in the background there listening. Up. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And have a wonderful day. And I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Thank you. God bless. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.